It is one of those cases that has never really left the public eye. In 1959, a 14-year-old named Stephen Truscott was convicted of murdering a 12-year-old classmate in Clinton, Ontario. His sentence? Death by hanging. Eventually, both that sentence and even the conviction itself were overturned, and Truscott's name became synonymous with the wrongly convicted. His story is now on stage at Soul Pepper Theater here in the capital city through to June 23rd, thanks to playwright Beverly Cooper, who joins us now for more. So nice to meet you. Gotta tell you, I saw the play and it's just terrific. Just Thank fantastic. Uh, so provocative and raises so many questions about justice in the province, so congratulations for you. You. to you for getting it done. Let's start with Eddie Greenspan, the most famous lawyer probably this province ever produced, who said, occasionally a criminal case is elevated to almost mythological proportions and raises profound questions about the criminal justice system. One standard by which a legal system may be assessed is whether it convicts only the truly guilty. Perhaps no case has raised that issue more starkly before the eyes of the Canadian public than Stephen Truscott's conviction, possibly the most famous murder case in Canadian criminal law. What made it so? Well, I think what made it so remarkable is that we almost hung a 14-year-old boy for a crime that he did not commit. And I think it has so many ramifications uh, for that community, for the country, and, and for the world who looked at this case. And I think people have a, a real uh, strong relationship to this case and their own relationship with judicial system, with authority. I think it has so many ramifications, but I think it's really that element of a 14-year-old boy that we almost hung. I want to find out more about your relationship to this story. Okay. Where, where are you from originally? I'm from Vancouver. You're from Vancouver? Yeah, so, so I you, actually didn't really know that much about the case before I, I started writing this I was going to say, yeah. how did you, you didn't live through it here, obviously. No, I didn't. So how did you get onto this in the first place? So in 2007, I had a play at the Blythe Festival, which is this wonderful festival in southern Ontario, uh, west of Stratford near Goderich. Mm -hmm. um, and the artistic director of the Blythe Festival, Eric Coates, said, would you like to write a play about Stephen Truscott? Because the case had happened in that area. And did there, you know who he was? I kind of did. I mean, I'd certainly heard different things. He'd been in the news more recently. And I have a really good friend, Anne-Marie MacDonald, who's a, oh, a yeah. writer. Great author, yeah. Yes, and she'd written a book called The Way the Crow Flies, which mm -hmm. is based on this case, but it's a fictional uh, book. And so I took her for a drink and I said, okay, tell me about the case and tell me what you know and, and, and do you think this could be a play? And she started talking about it and then she handed me her research materials, which I started to delve into and I realized it was such an amazing case, an amazing story that I thought I wanted to tell. But I was working on another project at the time and I told the artistic director, Eric Coates, that I wouldn't be able to write it you know, for a couple of years and he said, well, it's back in the news. We need it for next summer. And if you don't want to write it, we'll give it to somebody else. So, so you I said, in. okay, I'm, I'm going to jump in. And when you do that, how do you, how, how do you know how to tell a story on stage? Well, you don't. And you, I, I call it as a playwright, I say, I'm, I need a way to find it, my way into the story. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, um, it, why, why shouldn't somebody just pick up a book about it or, or read the, you know, see a documentary? Why is it a play? Why is it theatrical? And so originally I thought, well, I'll, I'll just do the, 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 the trial, but there was many trials. Mm -hmm. And also this story was more sweeping than that. So I had to find my way into the story. So I came across, came up with the idea of uh, creating a fictional character and the play, seeing the story through her eyes. And that was kind of, my aha moment where I went, okay, now I know what I'm doing This here. is the, the sort of young woman in the play who, yeah, we do see it through her eyes and she tells us the story. It unfolds yeah. in her eyes. And you know, what interested me about the case was partially the effect on the community, but also the effect on those kids. So they, you know, these kids were, uh, had one of their classmates found raped and murdered and the other one, you know, convicted of that murder. And, and the effect on, on them. So what I did was I created a fictional character who's a classmate of Stephen and Lynn's. Mm. And the play is seen through her eyes. Who else, did, I mean, did you interview any of the people who were around at the time? Yes, so I, it was important to me to inter interview as many people as I could. I certainly read all the court transcripts, and, mm. but to, to speak to the real people, that was important to me. So I spoke to um, 
Bob Lawson, where the, who the body was found on his farm, and he'd been a friend of Steve's. And I spoke to childhood friends of Steve's, and I, talk, I spoke to people who thought he was guilty, those who thought he was innocent. And I spoke to Isabel Laborde's son as well. Isabel Laborde is the journalist who happened on the story and, and really brought it back into the public. Yes, she's attention. the hero of the story. She's the hero me. of the story. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, the assumption would be this is a small place in Ontario. This is not Toronto, right? This yeah. is a small community. And the assumption is these folks are sick to death of talking about all this. Did you find that to be the case? Well, I know previously, a previous artistic director had wanted to do a play about Stephen Truscott. And he'd started putting the feelers out that he would do it. And he got threatening letters. And I yeah. think that's because um, families had been divided about this story for so mm -hmm. long. And, it'd been, and, and I think they didn't like the way they'd been painted as kind of you know, backwater hicks that tried to lynch a young boy, because that's mm -hmm. not the case. And so I think they really didn't want to. Um, people were reluctant to speak to me at first. But I think when they saw that I was going to try to do an honest retelling and that it was an important story to tell, I think they would be behind it for sure. I have to ask you, obviously, whether you got any time with Stephen Truscott himself? Uh, I, a little bit. So I'll, I'll, I also felt it was important not to cause more harm with my play, mm -hmm. to, to bring any more pain to the Truscotts or, or indeed the Harper family. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought I could interview him, but I thought I better have a question that he'd never been asked before. And I just kind of didn't come across that question that I felt right contacting him. But I knew quite early on that he was going to come see the play, and that certainly kept me honest. And then on the last performance of the first time it was done in Blythe, he came to see the show. And I knew he was coming because I had arranged the tickets. And so I asked the box office for a ticket for myself, and they sat me right behind him. So I was watching him watch, watch a play, play about, about his him. life and, and the enormity of that. I just found it so emotional. And did you talk to him after the play was yeah, over? Yeah, he was what there he with his wife and his, some of his childhood friends. And he came back and met the cast. And they, he was so gracious and supportive. And, and you know, I think it was probably difficult for him. But I think he felt that we did a good job of it. And one of his friends thought it might have been hard for him to see the stuff about his mom and his family. But he'd been through it so much. Yes. And, and I'm sure he'd like to put it behind him. But We are just two days removed from the 59th anniversary of this event. It was June 9th, yes. right? 1959. Yeah. Um, you know, we should try to just in, in as brief a, f a fashion as yeah. you can, because I want to dive in deeper. You should just sort of remind everybody what the, what the events in question were. Yes, so June 9th, 1959. It's a beautiful, hot summer evening. And we're just off an air base in, near Clinton, Ontario. Which is? Uh, so near Go towards Goderich. Right. Um, what do we call that? Sort of central southwestern Ontario. It's Huron County. Huron County. Okay. Or Tucker Smith Township is actually mm -hmm. where it happened, and um, so all the kids were out, you know, riding their bikes. It was really great. You know, they're going swimming in the swimming hole, and um, Stephen Truscott gave Lynn Harper, his 12-year-old classmate, a ride to the a ride to the highway, and. The next day, she was found missing. And um, she'd been raped. She was found, raped and murdered. And within a couple of days, Stephen was charged. Why? And, well, he was the last person known to have seen her. And I think he was a very convenient um, person to be found guilty. Um, he wasn't uh, an officer. He, wasn't, he was the son of a non-commissioned officer. He was a 14-year-old boy. He wasn't from town. He wasn't from the base. And, and I think they saw him very soon as a very convenient person to be charged. He had no motive? Uh, well, they said, you know, 14-year-old boy sexually charged, you know, got out of hand kind of thing. But it, Except he didn't have a reputation of being a no, sexually he's, charged no, guy. No, no, no. Yeah. And, um, and then there was a 15-day trial, 15 days, and they found mm -hmm. him guilty, and they sentenced him to hang. A jury of his peers. A jury of his peers, yes. And uh, But, you know, the... the um, Stephen, on his behalf, only had his dad and his lawyer working, you know, to get, gather evidence, whereas uh, the prosecution had the, the military, the OPP, every mm -hmm. person in authority, um, and they all thought he was guilty and they yeah, wanted him to hang. They all kind of decided early on in the piece that he was the guy and stopped looking elsewhere for yeah. potential suspects yeah. as well. Why yes. did they do that? $64,000 question, um, yes, I know. Yes, yeah. I, I, I think they just saw that, he, I think they, thought he was guilty and they were willing to make the evidence look like he was guilty. 
Um, you know, there was many other very good suspects around that they never followed those leads. Well, in fact, one just came out the other day. I mean, there was I, a... I didn't hear that. There was a... What was a... a there was a, a piece online the other day I read about somebody who has also looked into this case as well, and the, the notion that there was sort of a mysterious soldier from the nearby air base who, uh, whose identity was unknown, but who also had been seen in the area at the same time, yeah. and, and no one even looked into that yeah. possibility. I mean, there was a, a, a man that had been driving around trying to pick up young girls, yeah. and, and they knew that, and they never really followed that. I hmm. think uh, they wanted Stephen, and they went after him. Hmm. The people in the town and the impact they had on the ultimate verdict, uh, some of whom, as you describe in your play, were very um, unsure about the testimony they were giving, but they gave it anyway, and that testimony had great weight. How do you make sense out of all of that? Well, certainly the jury, I do not blame the jury, because the jury got the evidence that they had, mm. they were given. They, they only went by that. Those in authority should have known better, but I think, you know, a case, something like this had not happened in a small town where this young girl, uh, this young innocent girl had gone missing. Mm -hmm. And I think there was this rush, we've got to find whoever did it. And, and I think there was also the feeling, well, if the OPP says he's guilty, they must know something we don't know. And surely we've got to support that, right? Big, I think Big they, belief in our institutions back then, right? Really, I think this yeah. is the moment where we kind of lost that. Hmm. Did the people of Clinton at the time agree with the verdict? I think they did. For the most part, I think they did. But there was many people that always believed in his innocence. The people that knew him absolutely believed in his innocence. And there's many families that I know of that were divided about it and, and, and always believed in his innocence. But I think when you have a trial and it, they say it's guilty, and that's, that's I mean, I tend to believe that. Um, but it yes. never occurred to anybody that they actually might have got it wrong, right? That, well, I mean, that's certainly what I drew from your plane. From yes, your play. they didn't until mm -hmm. Isabel Laborde came along. Well, let's talk about her now then, okay? Isabel Laborde uh, was not there at the beginning. She came to this story later. Yeah. What brought her to the story? Well, she's pretty amazing because she was a single mom living in Rosedale. Um, she had kids of her own, including a 14-year-old boy. And she wanted to write a magazine article for Chatelaine magazine. So she thought... Because her point of view was, even if he's guilty at 14, surely he needs help, not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So she took the bus, she didn't drive, and she went down to Clinton and started talking to people and started looking into it a little bit more and discovered what we have here is actually an innocent boy. And then it became her mission. And she uh, came from a family of lawyers and knew how to look at, uh, get transcripts and she read things and she was able to cross-reference. One thing I find interesting about the jury at the time, they weren't allowed to take notes. Now, I don't know if that's not the case, mm. but you know, if you're getting evidence on day one and contrary evidence on day 14 and the lawyer doesn't draw attention to that, you're probably not gonna, you're gonna miss that. But what she was able to do was cross-reference and look and, and see how the, the judge had directed the jury, which was terrible, mm -hmm. and, um, and all the mistakes they had made, and then started to write this book, and nobody wanted to publish it. And in fact, it wasn't published until 1966, but it did cause an uproar, and this woman, you know, who didn't really have a, you know, a legal background, was taking on everybody, the doctors, the lawyers, the OPP, the military, and I say, wow, you know, for that time, to do that, so... Didn't, it, wasn't there Pierre Burton angle in here as well? Yeah, he wrote a poem called Requiem to a 14-Year-Old Boy quite soon after Stephen Truscott was sentenced to, um, sentenced to hang. And so he um, wrote this poem for the star and he got terrible letters. It was basically saying, how, how we're really gonna hang a 14-Year-Old Boy? Mm -hmm. And it was very, it's a beautiful poem. It's in the play as well. And she read it? Um, and she, Isabel read that yeah. poem, and it's in the book, but he was, uh, got lots of threatening letters uh, about that because I think people thought, he's guilty, he should hang, and that's the way we do things, right? They were going to hang a 14-year-old boy on circumstantial evidence. Yes. With and no I, direct evidence tying him to the crime or the site or anything. Well, what really came down to it was time of death. And so the, the pathologist, uh, uh, Dr. Penniston from Stratford, came, 
you know, looked at the, where the body was found, took the stomach contents, uh, you know, put them up to a, a bare light bulb in a, a small dingy room and said, you know, time of death as between um, 745. And that's the time she was with Stephen Truscott. So that was really, you know, you have this person who says, I know this, this is the facts, I can look at this, this is the way it is. And, and so people believe that, right? How was Stephen Truscott eventually exonerated? Well, there was many things went through. You know, he had his, uh, his court uh, where he's convicted, then there was appeal. Then when the book came out, there was another superior court, uh, a Supreme Court looked at it. He was still convicted. And he's, he's in jail all this time, right? Uh, yes, yes. Stayed in jail for 10 years. 10 years, and then he gets out and he's living under assumed <clears throat> name and he gets married and has kids and the kids don't know and then um, he starts, his wife starts to think we should do something about this. And um, the Fifth Estate, which is the CBC journalistic program, mm -hmm. they started to look into it. And of course, Aidwick got involved, which is the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted, which is actually now they Innocence Canada. They changed their name, that's right. Yes, yeah. Innocence Canada. Innocence Canada. Got a hold of the story and they helped as well. Yes, yeah. So they brought it, hmm. they worked on it, and, <clears throat> and then, you know, he was acquitted. I don't know if it's possible to characterize his life since he got out of jail, but you want to give it a try? Well, I'd hate to speak too much for him, mm -hmm. but his son came to see the show uh, the other night, and um, Isabella Borde's son came, so I hear things from them, mm -hmm. and I would say he's trying to live as normal a life as possible. He has child wonderful children who love him dearly, and great-grandchildren, so... Um, what did he do for a living all these years? He worked as a millwright, I think. He, yeah, he learned a skill in prison. and Whereabouts? Uh, I, well, he, well, he was in Guelph, and then he went to Kingston Penn. But he didn't go back to Clinton? Uh, he went, no, he went to Guelph. Hmm. Yep. Can, I mean, he seems, uh, I saw him interviewed on the Fifth Estate yeah. program as well and, and uh, over the years, and he, he seems a remarkably free from bitterness, free from anger type of guy. Yeah, he, How did he do that? I, I think my own, that he realized early on that it wasn't going to do him any good to go down a, a road of bitterness. I think his family was very strong and, and instilled that strength in him. His mom was really strong and, and said, don't, you know, we're here for you. We are standing by. We know you are innocent. And, and Isabel Laborde, for sure. So I think, and, and, but what's interesting, when he came to see the show in Blythe, he... One of his friends says, the guy that you see now, kind of shy and assuming, gentle, sweet, that's the same guy we knew who was 14. Hmm. And so I think he just held strong. And, and now he, he has uh, a good family life and people, uh, great friends. His friends who were friends with him then are friends with him now. And I think that says a great deal about his, his, the, the personality that he has. Indeed. Uh, you would like to believe 59 years and two days later that nobody could be found guilty in this province for murder who didn't really do it. Are you there? No, I'm not, actually. I think, um, I think if somebody says to me, what, you know, what's the message of my play, I would say it's that the judicial system is run by humans. Humans are fallible. And so we must always remain vigilant. Uh, and, and, you know, the Colton Bushy case is a good, is a good case, mm. you know, to look at. I don't think justice is actually served in that case. And um, I think that we always must be looking and, and questioning. And I think for myself, you know, if somebody's found guilty or, or you know, I, I quickly make a judgment that they must, have, they must know things that I don't know. But mm. I think we should always be questioning that and making sure that we are watching and keeping an eye on it. And Beverly, in our last minute here, we know Stephen Truscott didn't do this. You yes. know who did it? No. And I wouldn't start to, to say, oh, I think it's this person, because I wouldn't want to do what was done to Stephen mm -hmm. Truscott. But I would say there was many good suspects, and whoever did it is likely long dead. But um, the fact is there were so many other potential suspects that they never followed. That, to me, is a real crime. Well, the play is called Innocence Lost, a play about Stephen Truscott. It's at Soul Pepper until the 23rd of June, and it is worth your time. That's all I'd say. I'm not a, not a theater critic, but I, I think I can say that. Okay. It's great to meet you, and thank you so thank much you. for it's doing it. Thank you. It's been great to chat to you. Beverly Cooper, Innocence Lost.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.